Support for this podcast and the following message come from American Express, offering charging credit cards to help business owners cover the big purchases they need to make when they need to make them. More about American Express business cards and services can be found at open.com. What did you think of New York? Was it overwhelming to you? Or were you, did you? What did you think of it when you got there? It looked like a very strange place, this New York that you see in movies like was Gotham, where the smoke is coming in a very yeah. cold night from <laughs> every street. So I had like 50 bucks in, in my pocket. I was going to 50th Street between Lexington and 3rd, and the driver dropped me in 193 between 8th and 9th. So how'd you uh, get to the restaurant? Uh, walking and <laughs> w- walking. <laughs> I arrived very late. They were very upset with me. It took me like almost two hours to make it there. From NPR, it's How I Built This, a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, idealists, and the stories behind the movements they built. I'm Guy Raz, and on today's show, how Jose Andres went from tending the fire at his father's cookouts to building a restaurant empire, and eventually changing the way Americans eat out. So over the past 10 or 15 years, you might have noticed a trend at restaurants all across the U.S., where you get there and the waiter says, okay, here's how it works, everybody orders one or two or three plates and you all share it family style uh, and you get, you know, some octopus or some shrimp floating in olive oil and some lamb or whatever and everybody eats it. Well, the person who might be most responsible for that trend is the Spanish celebrity chef Jose Andres. He basically started the small plates movement in the U.S. And his company, Think Food Group, now has 25 restaurants across the country in places like L.A., Miami, Vegas, and here in Washington, D.C. Anyway, Jose grew up in Barcelona. And even when he was a kid, he was fascinated with food. My father probably is the one that helped me to understand the meaning of being a cook. Uh, My father would always cook on Sundays for families, for friends. And he would make a big paella, that traditional Spanish rice and he will never let me cook. He will always put me in charge of making the fire. He will send me to the forest to pick up the wood. And one day I got upset, Daddy, I want to cook. And he said, no, I need you in charge of the fire. It's very important. I got so upset with him, he sent me away. When the paella was finished and he fed everybody, he got me on the side and told me, my son, I thought that you understood. I gave you the most important task. Cooking itself, it's easy. If somebody's controlling the fire, you want to be a great cook, be in charge of the fire, then you will be able to cook whatever you want in life. That was the big lesson. So you're a kid and you decide, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a chef. I was not very good at school. I had a very difficult time uh, concentrating and I went to cooking school. Mm. I never graduated. Uh, they gave me the diploma last year, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, almost 30 years later. Um, and I, I failed cooking, English, and accounting. You failed cooking, <laughs> English, and accounting. Yeah, not a very good great, future. Great, yes. A good <laughs> recipe for success. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And then uh, um, I will always be working. For me, it was not working. For me, I was like a little kid in a kitchen. For me, it was like if I was a little wizard and I was, uh, you know, in this castle, in this tower where the witch or the the master wizard was there trying to teach me. I was that kind of a guy. Uh, I will spend every minute I could and I had free in any kitchen that there was in need of help. Where, where was this? Hands. This was in Barcelona? In Barcelona yeah. at the time. And so wherever there was a kitchen, you would go uh, and work? I, I, I would be there. So uh, I was working in very high-end restaurants uh, for lunch. I was uh, doing caterings for thousands of people at dinner, but always doing something. During summers, I was very lucky because I feel I always had somebody looking after me, thinking about what I should do next or taking care of me in trying to yeah. to learn. 
I, so was this man called Jose Puch? Um, for some reason, I became like his child. He was a chef? He was an amazing chef, one of the, the best chefs in Spain. He ran a restaurant called Reno, the, the, the restaurant of the aristocrats of Barcelona. And he was the one always guiding me where to be. But then one summer, he sent me to Rosas, a tiny village of fishermen two hours north of Barcelona, very near France. And I went to work with a man called Ramon Closas, a crazy man, a crazy chef that he will give you guidance by throwing you a hot pan towards your head. <laughs> that was the way of learning and the way of teaching. But I'm telling you that this town was very important for me because there is where I met Ferran Adria. And F Ferran Adria was uh, the, le the legendary chef at El, El Bulli, which is, I guess, the place that sort of introduced molecular gastronomy. Yes. So h how did you meet him? Did he, did he just like walk into, the, into your restaurant? Yeah. He sat at the bar. He ordered gambas al ajillo. And he was already famous at that uh, point or no? No, no, no. He Unknown. Was, he was a 23-year-old kid. I was a kid, but he was a kid too. But already he had an aura around him huh. of the guy that was pushing the envelope, the guy that lived in this kind of little house up in the mountain where the restaurant was and where sometimes nobody showed up, no one guest, no one customer. But he had an aura around him. And right there, right then, is the moment that kind of I seal with him the deal of I'm going to your restaurant next year, to the restaurant that somehow almost over the last 30 years has set the bar of yeah. what cooking and what's the future of gastronomy. I mean, so so you have this encounter, a chance encounter with Ferran Adria, and you basically figure out a way to work with the guy. And not just that, but... The restaurant that becomes the most important restaurant in the world. Yes. Wow. I mean, that's that is that uh, the, is luck. The way uh, that I, is incredible. But the way I yeah. see that was, I, I think luck only happens when you are actively moving and searching for what is next. I think when you are at home saying, "Man, things are not happening to me." Sure. What are you doing at home? Go and walk. I don't care where. Start moving. Look for the horizon. I was looking for my horizon. So, so what was it like to work at, at El Bulli? Uh, in that restaurant, we began kind of rebelling to anything that was coming from France. From France? Yeah. Not in a bad way. It was only like Ferran was very clear, like, we, we cannot keep looking for inspiration going to France. We need to start looking inspiration within ourselves. And I feel I was in the beginning of the explosion. I was in the moment that something amazing was created, a new universe was being created. I was there right when the explosion happened. Yeah. And it's something you don't realize until a few years later. What was it like to be in that kitchen in those early days? Was it just crazy? Was Ferran nice, kind? Was he tough? Was it, what was the atmosphere there like? Well, Ferran was all of the above uh, because things were happening in very quick moments. One moment, uh, I remember I had a gelatin of almond milk. Everybody knows that the gelatin is good when it's cold. If it's hot, it melts. I had a pot of hot oil. Ferran came towards the gelatin of almond, and he began looking at the oil. And I could see that he was thinking about dropping the almond milk into the hot oil. All of the cooks in the kitchen, we were five at the time, we were quickly looking at each other. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Why he's going to do it? This is going to be bad. Everybody knows if you put a hot gelatin in hot oil, it's going to melt and it's going to explode. Well, in that moment, the almond milk going into the hot oil yeah. exploded. Twelve years later, he created the liquid croqueta that you will put in your mouth will be like a traditional croqueta, the flavor of chicken, and will explode in your mouth. But that was the message of who Ferran Adria was. The message was, don't be afraid of trying huh. and don't take things for granted. You have to experience and discover things in your own. If you follow the teachings before you, you are only following what somebody else has done before you. You need not only to read and and learn the theory you need to discover on your own 
that's the moment of true learning. So you're at El Bui, you're into the early 90s, and you you moved to the U.S. How did that happen? How did you end up coming to the U.S.? Well, in between working at El Bui, I, I was in the military service. I had to do the military service. It's compulsory in Spain, right? You had to now, yeah. no, but in the old days, yes. <laughs> well, happens that I I got my military service. They sent me to Cadiz in the south of Spain. I had a great service in the Navy. I had my own apartment, cooking for the Admiral, dancing uh, flamenco and drinking sherry and living the life of a young sailor. So I finished my military service and I was like, I guess I am without a job. I have no place to go back to. Then I call, I make one phone call, one of my teachers, he tells me, it's a restaurant opening in New York, Jose, and they need somebody in three days. Wow. I'm like, okay, three days, all right. I'm ready. Well, what did you think of New York? Was it overwhelming to you? Or were you, did you? What did you think of it when you got there? Well, the arrival was very amazing because it looked like a very strange place. This New York that you see in movies like was Gotham, where the smoke is coming in a very yeah. cold night from every street. So I had like 50 bucks in, in my pocket. I was going to 50th Street between Lexington and 3rd. And the driver dropped me in 193 between 8th and 9th. So how did you uh, get to the restaurant? Uh, walking. And <laughs> w- walking. <laughs> I arrived very late. They were very upset with me. It took me like almost two hours to make it there. Wow. What was the restaurant? <laughs> the restaurant was called Paradis Barcelona. That was a chain. Uh, uh, this was right before the Olympic Games of 1992 Barcelona. And every Spanish company, and especially Catalan company, they all wanted to be in America. Uh, and they wanted to be in New York. So you're working in this restaurant, and, and I mean, did you like it? Was it is it interesting? Uh, no. So, <laughs> so I arrived there. Very quickly, I realized that that's not the place I was aiming for, coming from El Bulli. So I told them I was leaving. I get a phone call from Chicago. The great Richard Melman, one of the legendary restaurateurs of America with hundreds of restaurants. I met him and he tells me, Jose, I don't know what you will do in life, but whatever you do, throw the anchor and belong. Learn to belong. Hmm. In that moment, I received this phone call from Washington, D.C. I have these opportunities. I come to Washington, D.C. I met my partner. You mean these are your, your new partners? Yes. And, and what, did, what did they want you to do? They were dreaming to open a Spanish restaurant, and I landed with the aim of opening Jaleo around January 1993. Okay, now, Jose, we should pause here and mention, because we're in D.C., and I, I've been here a long time. This is like 1993, 94. Like, at that time... People did not really know what Spanish food was. That wasn't common food in America. So how did you, like, how did you know that you could actually create a market for that? Tapas are are a way of life more than a type of food. Tapas in Spain, in Seville, you go with your friends in a bar. You don't sit. You are always standing up and you have one beer, one, two snacks, and you move to the next one. Obviously, I cannot come to America and try to impose a way of life. What Haleo did that was very different from the Spanish cooking that was happening before, especially restaurants in Florida, in New York, with big Spanish populations, what we did was that we had a very long menu and where we were really telling people that sharing was the way forward. When we come back in just a moment, Jose Andres with some advice about sharing plates, sharing a business, and sharing the title of chef. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to How I Built This from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First to HelloFresh. 
They're the meal kit delivery service that makes cooking fun, easy, and convenient. HelloFresh sources the freshest ingredients measured to the exact quantities needed, along with step-by-step -step recipes for delicious meals designed to take 30 minutes to make, all approved by a registered dietitian. Everything is delivered in a special insulated box with free shipping. How I Built This listeners can get $35 off their first week of deliveries. Just visit HelloFresh.com and enter promo code BUILT on your first purchase. Thanks also to Stamps.com. Stamps.com wants you to know that with the holidays fast approaching, the post office is getting busier by the minute. Avoid the hassle and use Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage for all of your letters and packages using just your computer and printer. Right now, sign up for Stamps.com and get this special offer, a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone, and type in BUILT. Oh, and just one more thing before we get back to the show. Please do stick around to the very end because we're going to hear about your stories and the products and companies you are building. We've been getting literally hundreds of these stories from you. We really love reading them and, and sharing them with you. So please do stay with us till the very end. And now back to the show. It's How I Built This from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. So it's the early 1990s, and Jose Andres has opened a new tapas restaurant in Washington, D.C., his very first, and it's doing well. Except some of his diners don't really want to share their food. And I always gave this answer, which is very true. It's like, I do believe that forks and knives were invented and created, not for eating, but they were invented to protect the plate from anybody take away your plate from you. Yeah. As we became more civilized, we began using forks and knives really to eat instead of protecting our territory. But I always tell people that tapas versus no tapas is only 20 inches. Yeah. If you want to do tapas, you put the plate in the middle of the table, and people know that that's the signal to share. If you don't want to do tapas, people, move your plate 20 inches towards you, raise your fork, raise your knife, and everybody will know that you don't want to share. That was my simple solution yeah. to make sure that even those people not uh, liking the sharing uh, will be comfortable in a place like Helen. And, and at this point, you are still, uh, I guess, in your, in your early 20s. So how did, you, like, how did you handle being the head chef? When I opened, I learned uh, that I was ill-prepared to be the head chef. Hmm. Think about it. Um, barely, I'm 23. I work in very high-end restaurants where we don't do necessarily volume, and we aim for precision, quality and right? precision. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm coming to open uh, this tapas Spanish restaurant when I really never manage a very big kitchen. Again, very young but with a lot of hours of experience in different environments, different restaurants, different people. All those things kind of without me realizing uh, my time in New York prepared me for very much believing that anything was possible. Everything can be possible. I mean, it's it's amazing because that restaurant, Haleo, is so associated with you, Right, and this this concept of like small plates, but but it was these partners who had the vision of creating it, and and now you have twenty five restaurants, and somehow you you guys are all still together, right? Yeah, well, everything has advanced and changed a lot over the years. We but we, like you're still with the same people. You didn't like fall apart and like have ego no. fights and like kill each other. No, no, no. It's amazing. We had fights. We had exchange of views, exchange of opinions. I imagine for them, I was a very young kid when I came, and much of what I have, I own it to them. And this is the message I send to many, not only chefs and restaurant people, but any business people. It, it is good that you are able to, to very early on in your life, to surround yourself with people you want to be with for many years ahead. Not only for family, not only for friendship, but also for business. And if you can mix the three, it's even more wonderful. This is a very powerful tool. And that's why I always tell people, don't, don't think that alone you can do more. Yeah. Together you can conquer the world. I mean, given that you're running a, a major company now with, with hundreds of employees, um, do, you, do you get to log as many hours or spend as much time in, in the kitchen or in the creative side of really building up 
interesting menus or do you kind of have to give let go a little bit and let other people come up with that stuff i i just spend a uh, a lot of of my what i will call brain time thinking and creating i cook at all hours in my free time and in my non free time cooking is what i really enjoy i see myself very much like a orchestra director he doesn't play any instrument but he's able to produce beautiful music but you know one thing i'm very lucky that they have chefs who chefs gms managers sommeliers that many of them they are as talented if not more talented than i am and what i have that always works very well is in in my thin food group we have what we call the thin food tank that's my creative arm and for me creating that arm of 8 9 10 11 12 individuals that the only thing they do is thinking creating and maintaining quality is a very powerful research and development tool and i use it a lot my team travels with me a lot we always go to far away countries we are always getting inspired because if you want to get inspired you have to be on the move when you put together this very big menu at haleo and and you created this sort of small plates um system there was there also any consideration of how how the economics of that would work because presumably you would be selling more more plates of food right so presumably it could help it would it, it did it help I me mean, did it help the restaurant meet its bottom line and, and beyond yeah at the end is uh it, it, it's a business like any other uh i can tell you you were harder when you have to put out 3000 small plates in one service than 1000 big plates it's more work uh, so sometimes, believe me, I'm like, I'm tired of small plates. I'm going to be sending the super <laughs> Just big Just a giant one. steak and potatoes. But at the end, it's like any other business. Yeah. Listen, at the end, even even it's people that will tell me, Jose, I, I don't want small plates. But then they go to a sushi restaurant. Um, um, what is a sushi restaurant? It's one small piece at a time. Uh, it's people that complain about the small plates and they go to Greek restaurants and what they give you is small bowls of hummus, of tzatziki, of baba ganoush. Uh, at the end, uh, it's very funny that today even when we have people complaining about certain things, uh, they're doing those things. They need to be thinking what's on their plate because today the way we eat is an amazing form of democracy because by what you eat, you are voting about the things you sh think should be not only on your plate, but in the plates of many others. So we all need to start thinking that you can vote with your plate. A plate is an amazing form of democracy. If you are a young chef or a young businessman or woman trying to get in into the food industry today, what advice would you give to a you know a a twenty two year old Jose Andres today? Well, um, the biggest advice is I wish I I finish high school. I wish I finish university. I have a seventeen year old daughter Carlota, and we're going through the process. And kind of seems she she's agreeing we're going into she's gonna do business because you can be anything you want and you will always work for yourself. I don't care if you wanna be painting in the middle of the streets of Washington, D.C. I don't care if you wanna be singing with a rose in Fifth Avenue. I don't care what's the crazy business you want to be part of. Make sure that you have the business background. Business is something I wish I learned when I was 15. Uh, I had 30 years of the school of life. Now I think I'm going to be putting these next 30 years in putting into practice everything I learned over the last 30. You, you have like uh, 25 restaurants. You've been on TV. You've got cookbooks. I mean, you've, you're, you're like a major celebrity chef, right? Yeah. But, but when you were a teenager in Spain, just, just like learning to cook, did you imagine you could ever get to this point? I don't think I ever uh, trained more than making sure that the next plate I put forward in front of somebody is the best it can be. Quite frankly, I always say I don't open restaurants. I tell stories. Sometimes I wish that I only had one restaurant and only one. And I will be there every day and every hour. But I know that I will be so bored 
<laughs> so I created a company around me that will fulfill my personal needs. But to this day, I still consider myself that I am only as good as the last plate I serve. Even if you do radio, you do the radio show once, you hope it's good, you fix it, but the radio show is going to be there forever and ever for anybody to listen to yeah. it. But food is very ephemeral. You get one chance. It disappears. Yeah. So this is how hard my profession is. You only have one chance to make it. Jose Andres he is a chef and the co-founder of Think Food Group. By the way, you should try his gazpacho. It's pretty easy to make. Just get some fresh tomatoes, cucumber, green pepper, a little sherry vinegar, olive oil, and garlic. Throw it all into a blender, and that's it. Delicious. Hey, thanks for listening to the show this week. If you want to find out more or listen to previous episodes, you can go to howibuiltthis.npr.org. And if you have a chance, please subscribe to our show through iTunes and let other people know about it. You can also write us directly at hibt at npr.org or tweet us. That's at How I Built This. Our show is produced this week by Ramtin Arablui, who also composed the music. Thanks also to Neva Grant, Sanaz Meshkinpur, and Jeff Rogers. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to How I Built This from NPR. You still with us? Okay, great, because we are now at the part of the show where we talk about your stories. And this one came to us from Dennis Darnell. You know, when, when I used to get home, you'd come in the house and there'd be that one fly flying around. You'd have no idea how it got in there, but it's flying around, it's bugging you. I think we can all relate to that problem. Anyway, one summer day in San Diego where Dennis lives, he and his wife, Joy Lynn, were sitting in the kitchen and they were watching a fly buzz all around. We sat there and watched it trying to get into the garbage can. And one of us said, why don't we drill a hole in the lid and let it in, but put a trap on the underside of the lid? And that is how the garbage can fly trap was born. Flies, of course, love garbage. So Dennis designed this trap where you drill a hole in the lid of your garbage can, and then you pop in this little plastic doorway for the fly. But there's also a second part, which is the cartridge, which is lined with fly paper. And so while the fly thinks it's going down into the garbage can, it actually walks into the disposable cartridge and becomes stuck. And once the cartridge gets full with like, you know, 100 flies, you don't have to look at them or touch anything sticky or gross. Instead, you just push the button on the lid and the cartridge falls into the garbage can. Dennis and Joy Lynn have filed three patents for this fly trap, and they sold them on their website and at Ace Hardware stores in San Diego. And just last week, we reached out to Ace Hardware headquarters, as, as well as Home Depot. For now, though, they're keeping their day jobs and enjoying the fact that their kitchen is pretty much fly-free. Hey, if you want to tell us about the company or idea that you are building, go to build.npr.org. That's build.npr.org. And thanks. Hey, thanks for listening to the show this week. If you're still looking for another great NPR podcast, please check out Pop Culture Happy Hour. There is so much out there to watch and listen and read and discuss. It becomes so overwhelming. But this show, Pop Culture Happy Hour, helps you sort it out and figure out what's worth binge watching, downloading, or reading. Pop Culture Happy Hour calls out the best, most creative, and most fun things out there. You can find something to make you happy every week on Pop Culture Happy Hour from NPR. Find the show at npr.org.